not a con. Okay, uh, welcome to my talk today. I'm speaking on cryptanalysis of hash functions. Uh, my name is Matthew Fanto. I currently work for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we're the government agency responsible for the SHA-1 hash function. So, uh, a few things that I'm going to talk about today is uh, hash function basics and how hash functions are actually constructed. Then I'm going to discuss the recent attacks against hash functions, which I'm sure you all have heard of if you follow any news sites. And finally, I'm going to talk about NIST response to, to these attacks. So what is a hash function? It's a one-way mapping that transforms an arbitrary finite input to a fixed size output. And what this means is it just takes a message of any size and it computes a fixed sized output, a digest of it. Uh, it's important to distinguish between uh, the type of hash function that I'm speaking about. And those are cryptographically secure hash functions and hash functions used in other areas of computer science. Uh, during this talk, we, mean, we strictly mean cryptographically secure. Uh, the term one way implies that given an input, it's easy to compute the output. So you, know, you have a message, it's really easy to compute the, the hash of the message. But given a hash, it's computationally infeasible to find the, the input that produced that output. And thus, it's one way. You, know, you can only compute in one direction. Okay. Uh, why do we need hash functions? Hash functions are some of the most versatile cryptographic primitives. You know, block ciphers are generally used only for encryption. You, know, you have RSA in that, which is used for signatures and public key operations. But hash functions can be used for pretty much everything. Uh, it's mostly used for message integrity to ensure files haven't been modified. Um, but it's also used for random number generation. Uh, the Linux kernel uses SHA-1 in dev random. Um, it's used for authentication. It uh, can be used for encryption as a stream cipher. It's used everywhere. One of the most common uses of hash functions is uh, to store passwords. And this is because hash functions are, in fact, well, we believe they are one way. So you can store, instead of storing the user's actual password, you can simply store a hash of the password. If your password file was later compromised, if someone managed to grab a copy of it, uh, they wouldn't be able to actually invert the hashes and find the original password. So it makes for a nice password storing scheme. Okay, how do most f hash functions work? I say most because really there's only two widely used hash functions, and that's MD5 and SHA-1. I don't have any actual statistics, but I would venture to say probably close to 100% of hash function users are using either MD5 or SHA-1. So it's probably a safe assumption to say how do all hash functions currently work. Um, so throughout this entire talk, we're going to let n denote the size of the output. So in the case of MD5, for example, uh, MD5 has a 128-bit output, so n would be 128 bits. Um, we're going to let b denote the internal block size. Um, usually b is bigger than n. You know, when SHA-1 or MD5 operates on a message, it expands the message uh, and works on 512 bits at a time and compresses these 512 bits down to the block size. So hash functions start with a, a, fixed, in a, a fixed IV. Uh, it's defined in the standard as to what this IV should be. The IV is copied to internal registers and then the hash function actually begins. So it works by breaking the message up into block sizes of B bits um, again, as in the case of MD5 and SHA-1, uh, these blocks are 512 bits in, in size. It needs to pad the last block to be a multiple of the block size. You know, so if your message is only 511 bits, then it needs to, uh, to pad out to uh, 512 bits. So next, uh, a compression function is applied to the messages, which transforms the 512 bits down to the output size. So SHA-1 will take this block of 512 bits and compress it down to 160 bits. Uh, it then updates the IV. It combines this compressed block with, with the IV somehow and 
moves on to the next block. So, and it does this 80 times for SHA-1 for each block. So when all the blocks have finally been processed and the, the IV has been updated, you know, for every block this IV has been updated, the IV is the output of the hash. Uh, and this is just the description in more symbolic terms for those that care. Um, so it's important to realize that the message is processed sequentially. That is, you know, it moves from the first block to the second block to the third block, and it doesn't do anything in reverse. Um, so if you manage to find a collision, and I'll define what a collision is in a few slides. If you manage to find a collision somewhere in the hash, Anything after, if it's identical, if the two messages are identical, then they're going to produce the same output. You know, it doesn't move back. You know, it doesn't process in the, in the reverse direction when it's through. So, and you'll see better examples of this in coming slides. So a little bit about MD5. It was designed by Ron Rivest of RSA fame. Uh, Dr. Rivest is the R in RSA. Uh, it's specified in RFC 1321. It has a maximum input size of 2 to the 64 bits and produces an output size of 128 bits. The reason for the maximum input size will become clear as we discuss the attacks. Uh, if there wasn't a maximum input size, then a couple attacks would work and it would greatly reduce the strength of, of all these algorithms. MD5 is not a government standard, so it's not it's not able to be used in any sort of government application. Um, MD5 is very broken, so if you are using it, it's best to switch now. Um, and it most certainly should not be included in, in, in any future deployments of anything. SHA-1 is a government standard. It's specified in NIST FIPS 180-2. The maximum input size of SHA-1 is also 2 to the 64 bits for reasons that will become clear. Its output size is 168 bit, 160 bits. Uh, the increase in output size is also one of the major factors in, in the security of hash functions. And absent any other attacks, SHA-1 is a stronger algorithm just for the simple fact that it has a, a larger output size. Uh, SHA-1 operates with 80 rounds. Uh, there are attacks that work on reduced round variants, as I'll show in a, in a little bit. Uh, no collisions have been found in SHA-1, despite what some of the tech news sites like to claim. Uh, the only thing that has happened is the security bounds on SHA-1 have been lowered, but they haven't been lowered enough to actually make people wear, you know, worry that their systems are, are in trouble. The other important thing that I, I think I should define is what it means to break an algorithm. Uh, if you talk to different people, you know, their opinion on what it means for an algorithm to be broke varies pretty widely. The academic definition is, is one definition I like is a break is anything that makes the algorithm uh, not perform as advertised. So if MD5 claims 128 bits of security, anything that makes it not produce 128 bits of security is a break. It doesn't matter if it's 127 bits of security. It's still totally computationally infeasible to actually do it. It's still a break. Uh, other people define a break as something that actually compromises security of systems. You know, a lot of these attacks, they're still so complex that you know, no attacker in the world could actually mount these, and you know, thus your systems aren't in any jeopardy. So this is a basic problem, or a problem from basic probability theory. Anyone who's had an introduction to probability and stats course knows this problem, so I'm going to skip some of the math. I think it's covered probably in the first couple pages of every probability book. Uh, the question is, how many people need to be in a room for there to be a better than 50% chance that two people share the same birthday? Um, the number is actually surprisingly low. Well, I guess I shouldn't say surprisingly. Most people are surprised by the, the number. There only needs to be 23 people to be in a, a room for there to be a 50% chance that two have the same birthday. Uh, it's usually interesting at talks to actually do it, but I'm not because I know there's going to be a collision in this case because I actually know someone has the same birthday as me. So uh, I guess I stacked the deck with that one. Uh, the reason the number is so low is that you're actually looking for any possible collision. 
So if we were to actually do this, I would check my birthday against each person in the room, and then the next person would check his birthday against each person in the room. Uh, pretty soon, you know, there's a lot of pairings that, that happen, and this is why you have such a low number. Uh, it's actually, a lot of people confuse this. I'm not looking for another person that has the same birthday as me. I'm just looking for any two people that share the same birthday. Uh, the amount of work to find collisions and hash functions is roughly the square root of pi times m, where m is the output size, over 2, or it's about 2 to the n over 2. I guess I have a typo. Okay. Uh, some of the generic attacks against hash functions. You know, before we can talk about the specific recent ones, we need to, to discuss the, the generic attacks. Uh, the first attack, and to be cryptographically secure, a hash function has to resist all these properties at the very least. There's a few others that it needs to, needs to have, but these are most certainly the most important ones. Uh, the first attack is called a pre-image pre resistance. And that is, you know, this goes back to the one-way feature of hash functions. Uh, given an output of a hash function, you know, given the hash, it's computationally infeasible to find the input. To do this, it requires about 2 to the n work. Um, you know, in the case of SHA-1, this is 2 to the 160, which is such an astronomical number that you know, we don't have enough computing power in the world to actually do this. Uh, the next requirement is second pre-image resistance, and this is given an input and an output h of x. It's computationally infeasible to find a second message, x prime, such that h of x equals h of x prime. So in this case, you're not actually looking for the input that caused it, but you're looking for a second input that, that produces the same hash. And I guess it's first important to, to point out that you know, with hash functions, there has to be collisions. You're, you're, when you look at SHA-1 and MD5, you know, you're mapping a message space of 2 to the 1. You, know, you can have messages up to 2 to the 64 bits in size, and you're mapping it down to only, only 160 bits. Uh, Dirichlet's pigeonhole principle, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. You know, if you have 10 pigeons and 9 birdhouses, and each pigeon is in a birdhouse, then one pigeon has to be in, or one birdhouse has to have more than one pigeon in it. You know, so given such a, a essentially infinite message space, you know, compressing it down to a finite size, you're, you have to have messages that go to the same output. So this property simply states that it's not possible to find a second message that produces the, the same output. The third requirement, and usually the one that's violated the most, and in all the coming attacks, this is the one that has broken MD5 and reduced the strength of SHA-1, and that's collision resistance. Uh, in the case of just finding collisions, like the birthday paradox, you're not looking for a specific input that causes a specific output. You're looking just for any two inputs that, that collide. You know, so you generate random, random inputs, and eventually, with about 2 to the n over 2, in the case of SHA-1, about 2 to the 80 work, uh, you're going to find, you have a pretty good shot of finding two inputs that produce the same output. Uh, the next attack I'm going to talk about is a, a recent one, the, the Zhu multi-collision attack. And it's an, ex, an extension of the, the, collision, the generic collision attack. Um, since hash functions were, you know, since the beginning of hash function design, the question sort of was, you know, given 2 to the n over 2 work required to find a collision, how much work is required to find, say, three messages that collide, or you know, 16 messages that collide? Uh, Zhu recently addressed this in one of his papers, um, and he found that constructing 2 to the t collisions takes about 2 times t times 2 to the n over 2 operations, which you know, is not much. You know, finding, say, 16 collisions only takes slightly more work than finding 2 collisions. Um, you know, a lot of cryptographers believe that the work was actually a lot higher. Um, you know, because it's pretty hard to find two collisions, so finding three messages that collide, you know, it's probably a little bit more, you know, probably a lot more difficult, but actually it's not. Um, furthermore, uh, Zhu has, because of this attack, uh, the Zhu multi-collision attack, uh, cascading hash functions are not considered secure. And in a lot of schemes people have proposed, you know, the idea is you take SHA-1 and MD5, 
And first you hash, hash the message with SHA-1, and then you append the output of MD5 hashing that message. The idea is, you know, it may be hard, if a collision is found in SHA-1, chances are you're not going to find it in MD5. Um, as the Zhu attack points out, um, apparently my slide, LaTeX didn't produce my slide correctly, but uh, that should actually be two pipe symbols to denote concatenation down there. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the Zhu multi-collision attack shows that you can't actually cascade hash functions. You know, you, you can't combine hash functions to get better results. So unless the first hash function is secure, then they're not going. It's not going to be. Yeah. Told you to turn that off. <laughs> okay. The the long message attack, and it appears this slide has a few typos as well. Uh, the two to the five five should actually be two to the fifty five. Uh, the long message attack. The way it works is you start with a long message, say two to the fifty five five hundred twelve bit blocks. You know, I don't know if there's any messages that are actually this size. You know, this is such a huge message size that you know, I, I would be surprised if, well, I don't believe any messages of this size actually exist. Uh, the attacker can violate the second pre-image requirement, and that is he can find a second input that hashes to the, the output of this 255 block message uh, if the padding scheme is done incorrectly. And this is why the padding scheme is, is of great importance with hash functions. Um, so with this 2 to the 55 uh, message sorry, block, with this 2 to the 55 block message, there's 255 internal states. If you remember how hash functions were constructed, it operates on a block and then moves to the next block, to the next block, etc., continually updating the, the IV. So after each block, you know, there's an internal state of the hash function. So given 255 blocks, 2 to, the two fi 2 to the 55 blocks, there's 2 to the 55 internal states. And because hash functions process messages sequentially, if an attacker can find a collision at any one of these 2 to the 55 blocks, if he has identical text on both messages after that, it's going to produce the same output. So he only needs to find a collision at any one of the intermediate states. So this gives them about 2 to the 55 targets. Um, to accomplish the, this attack, he hashes all 2 to the 55 blocks, storing the intermediate steps, intermediate states at each step. Then he searches among these intermediate states and looks for a collision with a shorter message. Uh, by the birthday paradox, you can expect to do this with about 2 to the n over 2 to the 55 work, uh, which is much less than 2 to the n. In the case of SHA-1, it's about 2 to the 105 versus 2 to the 160. You know, so you've significantly lowered the, uh, the, required, the, strength, the strength of SHA-1. Uh, this attack is <clears throat> stopped by both MD5 and SHA-1 by what's called Damgard Merkel strengthening. And this is the reason for the input size limit. The way the padding works on most hash functions is you know, first you append a, a, one, a bit 1, then you append some necessary zeros up to 64 bits minus the block length minus 64 bits. Then you take a 64-bit representation of the original message size and finish the padding with that. And what this does is you know, it may collide up until the, the last block, but because the long message, which is 2 to the 55 blocks, and the short message are different sizes, they're going to have a different final padding. You know, the message size is different. So it's not going to collide. Yes? Sure. Yes. When you talk about cascading hash functions, inside OpenBSD and the core tree, what they do there, I know they use a number of different hashing functions to find whatever the problem is that I don't know if you verify. Right. So would this mean that even if I verify this tarball with, say, MD5 and SHA-1, it's not necessarily more secure than this do Right, yes. Um, you know, you, you can't stick the MD5, the MD5 hash on the end of the SHA-1 hash and expect you know, there to be that much more security. You know, it's actually not much, not much more. Yes? What did you say about finding collisions against two different encryption schemes? Uh, there's, 
Well, I mean, I, what do you mean by two different encryption schemes? Like well, two Well, yes, it does. The the paper he he gives uh, the evidence that you know, if you use SHA one and MD five, it's actually not much more work than finding collisions in in just SHA one. And the original paper, I don't know. There's definitely not enough time to go through the attack right now. You know, the full attack. Uh, I can give you a copy of the of the paper, but you know, it essentially works by with the SHA one attack. Um, you know, you have two to the eighty different messages. You know, you've generated two to the 80 different messages for SHA-1 and found a collision. And it's likely that there's going to be a collision in there among MD5. So I can give you the paper if you want it. But, or I mean, we can talk about it after the talk. But um, I was sort of conflicted when writing this talk about how much detail to get into. Um, you know, I think for anyone who's seriously interested in how the attacks actually work, a talk is no substitute for actually reading the papers. So you know, this is sort of the high level details. And you know, if you're interested, I can talk to you more after the talk. You know, we only get an hour, though. Um, OK. Second, pre images uh, on n but hash functions for much less than 2 to the n work. Uh, this is actually an attack done by John Kelsey of NIST and Bruce Schneier. Uh, the attack extends the Zhu multi-collision uh, in the long message attack to find collisions in the last block before the padding. So they've improved on the Zhu multi-collision finding, and they use this to find to use to create a long message attack such that the the messages collide right before the padding. Uh, and as I said before, because you append the length of the original messages. You, know, you use the length of the original messages as the padding. Messages of two different sizes can't collide. Uh, they then present an algorithm called expandable messages, which can take this shorter message and actually expand it into a message of the target size. Thus, when the padding is finally, you know, when you compute the, the length at the end, it's of the same length. And thus, you found a second input that produces the same hash as the, the long message, the target message. Uh, their attack is impractical for a number of reasons. Uh, the total work to find these pre-images is actually more than just finding a straight pre-image, but it does vi I said that wrong. The, the total work for their, the, their entire attack is more than just finding a straight pre-image, but it does show that once you've done the necessary pre-computation work, you can violate the second pre-image principle. Um, so the other reason why it's impractical is, is the same reason the long message attack is impractical. And that's simply because you know, a 2 to the 55 block, 2 to the 55 blocks of 512 bits is such a large message. You know, it's, likely, it's unlikely that any such message exists or someone would actually try and hash it. I, I can't even imagine the computation time required to, to hash that. Uh, a few contrived examples of, of how these attacks actually affect security. Uh, in the case of a pre-image or a second pre-image, uh, it should sort of be clear that you know, if you can reverse the hash function or find a second input that produces the, the output, you can violate password, password schemes. Uh, you know, with a lot of schemes, MD, you know, with a lot of applications, they use hash functions to store passwords. It's simply because there are collisions, assuming they just do a straight hash of the password and you know, they don't do anything special to, to thwart some of these attacks, you know, there are multiple passwords that can get you on the system. So my user password, there's actually an infinite number of passwords. Well, close to an, I'm going to round up to infinite <laughs> because uh, it's such a large number that you know, it's two to the two to the sixty-four minus one sixty, which you know is such a huge number. It's essentially infinite. <laughs> uh, <laughs> infinite is a good approximation for it. Uh, so you know because there are all these collisions, there's actually all these different passwords that will work on my user account. So you actually don't need to know my password. You can find some other passwords that also work with my username. 
Um, the next example is probably the most contrived of them all. And that's if you can find collisions, then you can forge digital signatures. And the way this works is the attacker starts off with two different messages. I will pay you $10, and you will pay me $100. Uh, you know, if I want to use this attack against someone, they're probably not going to sign the message that says, you will pay me $100. You know, they're much more likely to sign the, I will pay you $10 message. So he generates slight variations of this message, uh, you know, changing things like white space and punctuation and wording and whatnot. You know, obviously, if the message was longer, he would have a lot more play in the message and what he can change. You know, I actually don't think you can change, I will pay you $10 two to the 80 different ways. Um, so he generates slight variations of each message, changing things like wording, white space, etc. And by the birthday paradox, you can expect to find collisions in about 2 to the n over 2 uh, operations. So in the case of SHA-1, well, MD5 would be a better example. In the case of MD5, after about 2 to the 64 work, which is on the edge of computing power right now, uh, he can expect to find a collision. And the way digital signatures work is public key operations are pretty slow. So rather than sign massive documents, you compute a hash of the document and sign the hash. So these two hashes hash to the, these two inputs hash to the same output. And if you agree to sign the document, this is I will pay you $10. I can remove the digital signature and put it on the message that says you will pay me $100. And then I can take you to court. And show the judge that you signed this message. So, okay. Yes? I'm sorry? What do, you, what do you mean they don't actually hash? Oh, no, those don't. I'm saying, yeah, no, no. Those, Right, yeah. I mean, if you had a Word document, there's so much additional information in a Word document that you, know, you can change so much different thing, you know, so many different properties and, and get all these different messages. Like I said, I don't think you could actually generate 2 to the 80 variations of that message. You know. <laughs> okay, now some of the specific attacks. Uh, I should mention one of the problems with the recent attacks is they were done by teams of Chinese researchers. And there's huge translational issues. Um, none of the papers have actually been translated to English. And our understanding is some of the results were actually presented at previous conf or well, were submitted to previous conferences, but were rejected because the referees couldn't understand the, Eng the English was so bad that they couldn't understand what the paper was saying. So, you know, that's one of the some of the the attacks I can't cover so much detail because they haven't been translated. And I don't read Chinese. So, uh, what's that? <laughs> yes. uh, so first, I'm going to just talk briefly about these attacks because they're. This is pretty much all the details known on them, but uh, no one uses these, so you know, they're not of that great importance. Uh, Havel was broken with only 64 hashes, so after you do SHA-1 64 times, Havel 64 times. Uh, you can find collisions. You know, this can be done in probably you know, under a minute on this laptop here. Uh, collisions were found in RIPE-MD as well. They didn't give any. The, the original paper by the Chinese researchers, led by Wang, um, they only gave the collisions. They didn't actually give the work required to find them, um, except with the case of Havel. Uh, you know, but you can verify that the, the inputs that they gave actually do produce the same output. So you know it's it's reasonable to believe that they were found with ease. Uh, collisions in MD4 it should be noted that MD5 and SHA-1 are both improvements on MD4. There's changes that make MD5 and MD4 significantly stronger. MD5 and SHA-1 significantly stronger than MD4, but uh, you know they are still based on the <coughs> based on the same initial design. Uh, collisions have been found in MD4, and it's actually so easy to do that you don't even need a computer. You can uh, do it with pen and paper. So I believe at the, the crypto conference, they actually did it on pen and paper and found collisions in MD4. Collisions have been found in SHA-0, and 
other pretty devastating attacks by Zhu and LEBM have, have found other flaws in SHA-0. Uh, a bit of a historical note, SHA-0 was the original NIST algorithm. Uh, few, I don't know how long after, it wasn't long after SHA-0 was replaced, NIST uh, re pulled the SHA-0 standard and released SHA-1. Uh, we had discovered an attack in SHA-0 and, and we'd replaced SHA. We replaced it with SHA-1, an improved version of SHA-0. Uh, Zhu has since found the attack. Uh, Zhu has probably found the most number of attacks against hash functions. Um, so, collisions exist in SHA-0. Well, they exist in every hash function, but they've been found in SHA-0. Okay, now on to MD5. Uh, the first result was by, I don't know if anyone speaks German here, um, can help me out with that pronunciation. Uh, okay. We'll go with that. Uh, found pseudo collisions in the compression function. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, in hash function design, you take the block size of 512 bits and compress it down to the output size. Uh, this only found collisions, and they're called pseudo collisions because they only exist in the compression function. They didn't work on full MD5. Uh, the attack was of no serious consequence, but um, uh, I guess the other thing, the other requirement for this attack was he actually changed the IVs, uh, which violates the standard. You know, the IV is fixed. Uh, you, you can't change parts of a cipher and break it and then claim you broke the cipher. Uh, in 1996, Doberton uh, discovered collisions in unmodified MD5. He didn't change the, the IV. Uh, he found the collisions in the MD5 compression function. So again, it wasn't of serious consequence, but you know, because the compression function isn't the complete MD5. So, but it did make cryptographers worry or question the security of MD5 in the future. Uh, around this time, around 1996, was when SHA-1 was being done. And you know, people were urging users to, cryptographers were urging users to start to move away from MD5. It's now 2005 and MD5 is totally broke and people are still using it, so. No one listens to cryptographers. Okay. Uh, the next major result took place last summer, and this is the one that started everything. Uh, it was when Wang, Fang, Lai, and Yu announced collisions in full MD5. Uh, again, they haven't released all the details of the attack. You know, they, they've only released the inputs that, that have produced the attacks. There have been some other improvements, and people can now generate collisions using sort of their scheme, but the way they did it still is not entirely known. As with most of their work, it's not entirely known. Uh, the MD5 attacks are just collision attacks, so you know, if you have a password stored on your computer using MD5, an attacker can't invert it and he can't find a second password that produces the same hash. This only allows them to generate bunches of different messages, random messages, and find two that collide. So he can use the, the I will pay you $10 attack. Um, uh, the claim is now MD5, can, MD5 collisions can be generated in under an hour on a home computer, uh, whereas before it took two to the 64 work, which you know, still is beyond the computing power of, of anyone but the most well-financed of attackers. Um, so. MD5 collisions are now pretty trivial to find. Uh, the actual method, uh, methods are still not public. The, one of the most interesting things that have come out of this, I believe, is the X.509 collisions. I don't know if any of you have seen this. Um, X.509 certificates are the certificates that SSL and TLS uses. So you know, when you go to a secure website, they present this certificate with you know, an X.509 certificate to you. And that's how you know you're actually talking to Amazon or any of the other sites. Uh, the attack, the attack isn't really of a practical nature. I mean, you can generate colliding X.509 certificates, but I and others have thought about ways of exploiting this, and you really can't come up. Well, I'll show you a, the best thing that we have come up with, and you know, you'll see that. It's really not going to have a practical, practical effect. Um, 
the, with the Clyde Next.509 certs, the requirement is all the, the certificate fields, like the subject name and the distinguished name and validity period, et cetera, are identical. The only thing that's different is the public key. Um, you know, so these two certificates collide, and they produce the same hash function. So you can actually use this to present a certificate to someone, and the certificate will validate against the certificate authority but the cert wasn't actually signed. Um, so recall that two messages produce a collision in an intermediate state, then any common text appended after the collision will lead to identical outputs. So if you begin by using the same values for every field of the certificate, you know, the subject name, the distinguished name, et cetera, uh, you know, if they're identical, then they're going to produce identical hashes. So I don't know how much of you, how many of you want me to actually do the math for the attack. Show of hands if they want to see the math. <laughs> okay, all right, we got some hands. Okay, <laughs> not many, but the attack has. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, the attack makes a few assumptions, and that's that the attacker can predict the validity period and the serial number. Uh, you know, when you have a certificate signed, you don't get to pick the validity period down to the second, and you don't get to pick the serial serial number that the the server is going to give, the certificate authority is going to give you. So, I guess it's not too unreasonable to believe that you can predict you know, how long the search is going to be valid. And with a lot of certificate authorities, they only increment the serial number. You know, with each cert that they sign, they just in increment the serial number. So, you know, it's not unreasonable to believe that the attacker could could guess these values. Uh, it's one of the other requirements is that the RSA modulus fall on a 64-byte boundary. And that's because of the way MD5 is going to process the message and the way the padding scheme is going to work. Um, again, he makes a few assumptions in that he can predict what the subject name is going to be. If the certificate authority does something to the subject name. So the original attack by Lundstra, they, uh, they gave sort of a, a way to ensure that the modulus is on a 64-byte boundary. But in real life, you probably don't get to do what Lundstra says, you know, what Lundstra used. So assuming all these things hold, and you know, the attacker can do this, uh, it's also required that he fix the exponent. And, like with most RSA, he just uses the fourth Fermat number uh, as the exponent, 2 to the 2 to the 4. Uh, since the text is identical up to the point of the modulus, the state of both instances of the hash function are also identical. So as you process the two x.509 certs, you know, they're identical up until the modulus starts. Uh, next, you use the collision finding technique of Wang and the, the state of the hash function up until the modulus is the IV. So you know, the way you would process a cert normally is you go through the fields and then you process the, the modulus and the internal state of the hash function right before, you know, as you process the modulus is the hash of everything prior to it. So you hash the stuff prior to it and use that. You replace the IV of SHA-1, of MD5, I'm sorry, uh, with this hash and use the, the collision finding technique to generate two different bit strings of uh, of equal length to uh, 1,024 bits. Yeah. Call them B1 and B2. Okay. The okay. Now you generate two two primes, P1 and P2, of approximately 512 bits, such that these primes are you know, P minus one and P2 minus one is relatively primed to to E. Now this is just basic properties of RSA here. Uh, next, you use the Chinese remainder theorem to solve the system of congruencies. And you know, by the Chinese remainder theorem, there is a solution. And there's actually an infinite number of solutions. Um, I, well, I should say that when solving this, you bound it so that, uh, well, right. So there's an infinite number of solutions to this, this system of equations. Um, OK, now for. Uh, I guess I'm missing part of this. Okay, so I 
left off something at the end of this. Uh, that's actually not a system of congruencies. Uh, this actually should be uh, B1 times 2 to the 124 plus B sub 0. And on the second line, also plus B sub 0. You know, so you're looking for the congruency such that B1 times 2 to the 1024 is congruent to negative B sub 0 mod P1 and negative B sub 0 mod P2, you know, which by CRT has a solution. You bound B sub 0 so that it's between 0 and P1 times P2. You know, there's only one solution to that equation. Um, but there's an infinite number if you don't bound it. And you'll see that in a second. Uh, now for k equals 0 to whatever, you know, off to infinity, you compute b equals b sub 0 plus multiples of p1 times p2. And this will give you the infinite number of solutions to that system of equations. So after generating b sub 0, you, you, know, you start with k1. I don't know if k0 would work. Well, yeah, it would. k0 would work. Uh, so you check k equals 0, then k equals 1, k equals 2, et cetera. And after you check each one of those, you, you compute b1 times 2 to the 1024 plus b over p1, and b2 times 2 to the 1024 plus b over p2. Uh, eventually, you're going to end up with, so, you're going to end up such that these two integers, you know, b1 times 2 to the 1024 plus b over p1 is prime. Once you have that, then you know that b1 times 2 to the 1024 plus b and b2 times 2 to the 1024 plus b are products of two distinct primes. You know, p1 and p2 are different, and q1 and q2 are presumably different. I should say q1 equals that division, but. So the modulus is now, or the two moduli, are now those two integers here. Okay. Since the certificates collide up to the modulus, the internal states of the hash functions before processing the modulus are identical. Now you found a collision in the modulus, so even though the two moduli are different, they produce the same output. So after you run, after the hash functions go through the, the moduli, it's going to produce, again, identical states in the hash function. So now you found two different x.509 certs with the same hash function, the only thing different being the public key. Uh, the only reasonable but highly contrived scenario is you know, sort of where the attacker could sign something and then later claim he didn't sign it because you know, he could just go to the certificate authority and say, you know, look, this was signed under this key, but that's not what my key is registered as. You know, I guess in you know, if you make all these other assumptions that you know, he could go to court and convince a jury or a judge, you know, raise enough reasonable doubt that he actually didn't sign it, then he may get away with it. Uh, you know, but I mean, that's not. You know, you're making assumptions that you can fool a jury now, you know, for this attack to work. So. Um, Again, the attack makes a few assumptions. Uh, solutions have been proposed by NIST and the IUTF to stop this attack. Uh, the first and probably most reasonable way to do so is to simply replace the serial number with a random number plus a counter. You know, if serial numbers are sequential, then he can predict what the next serial number is going to be. But if the CA adds a random number to the, ser you know, to the serial number, then he has no knowledge of what it's going to be. Uh, there's a few other proposed solutions, but this is probably the one that's going to be adopted. So the other are you add sort of fudge factor in, in the validity period where it could actually be valid for plus or minus a certain amount, and thus he can't actually fully predict the, the validity period. OK, next are the Shaw-1 collisions. The, First major result against Shaw one by, was by Vincent Reinman and Elizabeth Oswald, and it's an extension of the Shaw zero attack by by Zhu. The way the attack works is Shaw one has a bunch of nonlinear components to it. You know, if Shaw one was entirely linear, like with you know any crypto, if it's entirely linear, then it's pretty easy to break. So, what the, how the attack works is you first 
take out the nonlinear components and replace them with pretty good linear approximations of, of these components. Next, you find collisions in the, in the linear, in the replaced SHA-1, you know, SHA-1 with these linear steps instead of nonlinear steps. You generate a bunch of collisions, and then you use these collisions to find collisions in the actual SHA-1. Um, the better the linear approximation to the actual nonlinear approximation, the better the attack is going to work. Uh, with this attack, they were able to break 53, 53 rounds of SHA-1, though full SHA-1 uses actually 80 rounds. So you know, it's not a full break of SHA-1, and it's unlikely to be. You know, with, with a lot of algorithms, DES, for example, you, know, you can break DES up to four or eight or whatever number of rounds, but you know, full DES is perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, the most devastating attack against SHA-1 is also due to the same people that broke MD-5, and that's Wang's team in China. Uh, the full paper is still unpublished. No one's actually seen it except the translators. And the, the belief is that they actually had these results for quite a while, but no one took a look at them because they couldn't understand, understand the writing. There's another error in the slide that should actually be 2 to the 69 instead of 2 to the 6 times 9. Uh, the claim is that collisions can now be found in SHA-1 in only 2 to the 69 steps. So this reduces the birthday paradox attack from 2 to the 80 work to 2 to the 69 work. It's a pretty significant reduction, but 2 to the 69 is still beyond the computing power. It's at the outermost edge of the computing power of the world right now. Uh, you know, even though the paper is still unpublished, Wang and her team are reputable cryptographers. You know, they have, well, you have the MD5 collisions, the MD4 collisions, Havel and Shaw Zero collisions. You know, and they've done enough work that if they make the claim, it's, it's reasonable to believe they can actually do it. Um, it's important to stress that no collisions have actually been found. So Shaw 1, I guess if you want to take the non-academic definition, it, it's yet to be broken because you know, systems have not been compromised yet. Um, I mean, I, I can't explain their attack because you know, the attack is not known. It's not been published. So, uh, this is sort of the opinion of NIST and NIST's response to the attacks. How much time do I have left? Okay. Uh, this is NIST's response to the attacks. Uh, NIST has always said that MD5 should never be used. It's not a government standard, so it's not, it can't be used in government applications. Um, you know, this, these attacks just further give evidence to our claim you know, that MD5 should not be used. Uh, everyone's urged to either use SHA-1 or SHA-2, and you know, it's not just NIST that, that has been saying this. You know, cryptographers the world over have been saying for years now that MD5 shouldn't be used. Okay. Because collisions have not been found in SHA-1, and because the complexity to find collisions is still 2 to the 69 operations, uh, it's NIST's belief that SHA-1 is still fine in most applications. There's a lot of scenarios where SHA-1 isn't in trouble. With HMAC, for example, you know, with SSL and TLS, the SSL and TLS protocols, um, SHA-1 and or MD5 is used as an HMAC to provide integrity of, of packets that are sent between the server and client, you know, to make sure that an attacker hasn't modified anything. Uh, the attacker doesn't know the internal state of the hash function when, it, when the hash function begins processing the message, so he can't generate just collisions and expect them to work. You know, he would have to generate all these collisions for all possible keys. And so if you're using a large enough key, you know, he has to do 2 to the 69 work, 2 to the <coughs> 256 times, or I guess it'd only be 2 to the 160 times. So, yeah, which is you know, such a large number that it's not going to happen. Um, because these, the complexity of these attacks is still so large, uh, NIST believes that SHA-1 is still safe in most applications up until 2010. We're urging people that if they need security past 2010, uh, that they shouldn't that they should migrate to SHA-2, and this has sort of always been our stance. 
you know, we really haven't changed our, our opinion of this just because of the attacks. So anything before 2010, we're saying you can still use SHA-1. NIST, NIST had planned, out, planned to phase out SHA-1 by 2010 anyway, simply because computing power gets stronger. You know, computers get faster. Uh, in the future, NIST probably won't will not replace SHA-1. You know, because we're already starting to phase it out, we, so, we see no need to, to release a new SHA standard to replace SHA-1. You know, again, the complexity of the attack is still high enough. Um, Currently, there are no known attacks against the SHA-2 algorithms. The SHA-2 family is SHA-256, 384, and 512. And I guess you can include SHA-224, which is simply 256 truncated. Uh, the attacks against MD5 and SHA-1 do not work against SHA-2. There's no known attacks against SHA-2. The internal structure of SHA-2, of the SHA-2 algorithms are different. The only paper I think that I've seen on, on SHA-2 results is Phil Hawke's corrective patterns paper, which he just makes a few observations. There's, he doesn't present any results. Uh, for those people still requiring 160 bits of security, uh, NIST is considering re releasing a truncation standard, and what we would do is we would replace, we would release a standard that, we would, re we would release a standard that allowed, that specified how to take SHA-256 and correctly truncate it down to 160, 160 bits. But again, that only gives you 2 to the 80 strength against the birthday attack. And soon enough, 2 to the 80 is not going to be large enough. So you know, it's just sort of a something until everyone is migrated to SHA-2, which they should be anyway, absent any of these other attacks. Uh, again, applications such as HMAC and a bunch of others are unaffected. You know, I mean, I can't really list all the applications not affected. HMAC is probably the most, you know, the, the best example of it. So, and it's not to say that if you have some application using SHA-1 that, you know, just because you use HMAC, you're immune, or because you're not using HMAC, you're fine. So uh, I guess that's it. I'd just like to thank everyone at NIST, and uh, also like to thank the Nauticon staff for throwing this conference. And these are my references. And that's it. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes? Uh, just one really quick question. Okay. I know that these collision attacks kind of represent the first breaking down for a lot of hashing measures out there right now. Um, in your opinion, is there any sort of collision Okay, yes. I actually wanted to make this point. Thank you for asking. Um, it's sort of interesting that, you know, for how many years there were no serious attacks against any of these hash functions, and then all of a sudden they were all broken. Um, you know, with one paper, four hash functions that were believed to be reasonably safe. I say reasonably because, you know, no one trusted MD4, but, you know, still no one had really found serious attacks against it. Um, you know, with this, now HAVO and RIPE MD, MD4 and SHA-0, were broken. Then MD5 was totally broken. SHA-1 was broken. You know, so if you look at any of the conferences in the past couple months since the MD5 results, before there was no real papers on hash functions. Now that's all anyone is submitting is hash function papers. So pretty much the entire cryptographic community has switched to try and breaking hash functions because now they know it can be done. and. Uh, so yes, now you have the entire cryptographic community looking at hash functions and how to break them, whereas before you only had, I mean, when you look at the attacks, the, the name that kept coming up was Zhu. You know, Zhu was the main one doing the attacks prior to, prior to this. Now everyone is doing the attacks. So I don't want to speculate on if any attacks are going to come out in the next couple months, but you, know, you now have everyone looking at these. So. It's reasonable to believe that, yes, perhaps some more results will come out. Any other questions? OK. I think my time's up anyway. So. OK.